No notes, so we're gonna do this without presenter notes, so I don't know how well this is gonna go, but anyway, thank you for your patience. Uh, my name is Rick, I'm here with my esteemed colleague Ray. Uh, we work on the engineering team at Segment. We're gonna talk about how we saved a ton of money migrating from Aurora, which is nice but expensive, to Foundation DB, which is quite efficient and also nice. We're gonna talk about a few things. First, we're gonna talk about what Segment does since uh, that seems to be a question many people have. Uh, we're gonna talk about the use case of identity resolution. We're gonna talk about the data model we use on top of Foundation DB. Then Ray is gonna talk about uh, how Foundation DB saves us money, um, how we got to production, and some potential future use cases for Foundation DB at Segment. So what is Segment? Segment is a platform that you use to instrument uh, your mobile apps, your websites, uh, to get data from those about how your customers are using those products and forward them through Segment to standardize them, to make sure they're clean of PII, and to forward that information onto downstream analytics tools, A-B testing tools, mail campaign management tools, lots of stuff. Uh, so the idea is Segment delivers these amazing customer experiences. Uh, this is common, we see people using tools, they connect things all over the place, there's a lot of inconsistency, uh, data is going to the wrong place, uh, it's, it's full of stuff like PII where it doesn't need to be. Um, you may recognize some logos here, I hope that this isn't offending anybody for, for some reason. Uh, we call this, and we call this CDI, which is Customer Data Infrastructure. Now this is kind of a, you know, we have a few slides that are kind of from our marketing team, uh, but they help kind of illustrate like what we do because it's kind of complicated. Um, so the idea is we provide this single point of customer understanding and action. Uh, we help you synthesize your data. We help you standardize it, so clean it up. Make sure it's all in the same, same format um, and then collect all that from various endpoints from your, the Roku box sitting on top of your TV, um, and then power all the same tools from that same data. This is kind of a slide. You can kind of see this, is, this has nothing to do with actual reality. This is uh, just how the thing works conceptually. Data flows from the sources. We clean and synthesize it and push it out to destinations. So this is kind of a timeline. This is only really inserted here to kind of give you an idea of where we are relative to uh, Foundation DB's open source release in 2018, which is where we started to really be interested in using Foundation DB. So around the time that we launched this product called Personas, you see in 2017, we built this thing on top of Aurora, and then we started to look at Foundation DB afterwards. So what is identity resolution? This is the use case for Foundation DB at Segment. It's kind of in the center here. Uh, what we do is we try to build profiles of users that are, that are uh, using our customers' products uh, and that often means that they have various identities across the product that we want to unify into a single picture. And so what we do is we build an aggregated graph of data associated with a unique user. And this helps simplify analytics and provides a unified view uh, in your downstream tools. So a common problem you might see is a user go goes to a website or opens an email and then they're redirected to a website and all we know about you is some random ID we've generated and given in your cookie. So you can see this uh, anonymous ID. You might have opened an email, and uh, through the data that we collect over time, we're able to basically build a unified ID. You may log in, and you may complete a uh, transaction, and all of those events have different identifiers associated with them, and the goal is to basically provide a unique uh, ID that connect connects all those other identifiers together. So we do this using two different types of data, one we call mappings and one we call merges. And a mapping is what we do to connect an external, what we call an external ID, like an email address or a database ID, um, various other things, um, to what we call a segment ID, that universal ID. Uh, so right here in the example, these external IDs would be this user ID, 8Y, et cetera. Uh, the email is another external ID, sloth at segment.com, and we're trying to map those all to uh, this universal ID, use one, two, three. Now this comes with a problem, which is that we generate these new IDs, these new quote unquote universal IDs all the time, and we want to be able to at a future time merge those together uh, when we realize they're actually connected via uh, some other element of data. So that's what we call a merge. 
Now let's talk about what this actually looks like on top of FoundationDB. So we don't use any real uh, mapping layer. Uh, we decided to go directly to the KV store. Some of that is because we use, uh, all of our services are written in Go, and there isn't a ton of layer, imp layer uh, implementations for Go. So we directly use the uh, KV interface. Uh, we, use subs we use subspaces to structure our keys, and we have two types of KV pairs, so we call KV pairs. Uh, objects, which are basically um, surrogate IDs, keys, to JSON serialized objects, and indexes, which index those objects you know, based on the fields that are in those objects. So again, we do mostly point gets on these object KV types. Uh, value is a JSON serialized object, and when I say surrogate key, I mean just a generated key we use that doesn't really mean anything outside of our system. Uh, we also have these index KV kinds. Uh, we use a sub subspaces to segment the compound identifiers. Uh, we generally look up by key prefix, so we use get ranges for these. Um, and the, then the suffix of the key is the actual target, the thing that we're mapping to. So these have, the, suff the prefix will have multiple uh, targets that it's identifying in the system. Um, and the value is usually empty. So this is kind of what it looks like. Everything is prefixed by tenant because we're a multi-tenant system. Uh, this is one of them, might be an identifier type to an identifier. This would be a range prefix, and it's connected to this mapping ID, uh, JK, J2, LK, et cetera, garbage. Um, so let's talk about this first type of data, which is mapping data. So this connects an external ID, like Rick at segment.com, to a unified segment ID. All right, so this is kind of what it looks like. It's very simple. We have a tenant prefix and a mapping ID connects to the JSON object with the information in it. Very simple. Uh, sometimes we want to list all of these. Uh, we run various uh, reports and things on these. So uh, say you go to your interface and you want to see all of these mappings. Uh, literally, people want to do that for some reason. Uh, and so you can actually, we have a big index of all these mappings uh, that is, that is uh, ranged by tenant. We also have an ID index for the segment ID field. So you can see we can go search for specifically for segment ID and point directly at a mapping ID. There may be multiple uh, of one or the other. Okay, so merge data. So this is what, when we realize, we finally realize, hey, there's actually multiple mappings that connect to the same ID, and we need to bring these together, we create what's called a merge entry, uh, and those associate two quote unquote unified segment IDs. So this is what a merge object looks like. Similar to the mapping, it's a tenant prefix with a merge ID that's generated, surrogate key. Um, and generally, there's some other fields in here, there's some timestamps, et cetera, but the only things that really matter is it's like a graph relationship. It's a from and a to. And these are the segment IDs. So we have an index, the from index, very simple. It's the from field to the merge ID, and a to index, the to field to the merge ID. Very straightforward. All right. Now I'm gonna go to my friend Ray, and he's cool. gonna explain the rest of the gory details of the system. Thank you, Rick. Can you all hear me? How about now? It's better. Uh, okay, cool. Yeah, so I'm gonna talk a little bit more about um, uh, sort of the path to production, um, and uh, a little bit more about uh, operating the system in production, and then some future use cases. So. Um, these are essentially some of the, the, the needs of this, this workload. Uh, as you can imagine, um, it's a high throughput sort of workload. Uh, it's, uh, we, we project this system needs hundreds of terabytes of uh, uh, space on disk uh, replicated. Uh, it's not that large right now. It's more in the order of tens of terabytes, but uh, it's rapidly growing. Uh, and of course, the key piece is we need serializable uh, isolation levels. Uh, it's also it's, it's a very high volume sort of a read workload. Uh, so the read volume is much higher the writes than the writes, as you'll see in a moment. So a little bit about how data flows through the system. So the identity resolution system sort of uh, is teed off of a stream processing system that handles the uh, core data ingestion and then routing that data to all the destinations uh, that we integrate with. So data comes in, uh, starting from the left-hand side of this graph. Data comes into our API and into our core ingestion pipeline. Uh, there's a lot of systems not featured there, but we're just focusing on the identity service here part. So there, when it first comes into the ingestion pipeline, we store it in Kafka, and then we have some systems basically performing uh, validation, schema enforcement, things like that. Um, any customers who are using Persona, 
uh, that data is then teed off into the identity ingress topic. And then we have a service called the Identity Resolver. That service scales uh, in and out uh, horizontally as, as needed, uh, depending on the volume of traffic. And that queries the identity service um, right path, essentially, on the top left there. So that is where, uh, for every message that's coming in, essentially we're going to Foundation DB, uh, looking to see if we have seen this uh, identity before, this piece of data, and creating the mappings and mergings uh, as necessary. On the bottom half, we also have a, a read-only path, essentially. So um, that's just read-only request to Foundation DB for other systems downstream uh, that are, are looking for identities. Okay, so as we mentioned, we originally built the system with Aurora, and it actually worked pretty well. Um, there was there are some uh, nuisances for the developers, uh, and Foundation DB is actually a bit better. Uh, like one of the problems is you might do a read from a read replica, uh, and then determine, oh, I need to go insert a record. Then you go to the master and go to insert something, and another message had already come in and inserted that. So then you have to go back. It was sort of a bit of juggling, but Aurora worked. But um, the primary problem was uh, the cost. So uh, this is just like some uh, baseline cost for Aurora, just to like get an idea of the back of the napkin math we did when we started to co consider Foundation DB. Um, so basically, um, a terabyte and a billion IOPS a month. It's not too expensive. It's it's about a K uh, um, with a, a single instance. But if you can imagine, even like a, a medium-sized workload that uh, that basically. Um, grows to tens of thousands of dollars really quickly. Um, and this is only like 20 terabytes and 100 billion uh, IOPS a month. Uh, you're looking at tens of thousands of dollars. Um, <laughs> so uh, you can essentially um, basically provision. We, we determined that we, were, we, we could run essentially the same workload on Foundation DB for about a fifth or a sixth uh, of the cost. Um, so uh, roughly with the resources here. So uh, 20 i3 extra large instances, some stateless, and some transaction nodes. So. OK. Uh, so a little bit about our path from prototype to production. So prototype was, was pretty quick. We were able to stand it up. Um, pretty fast, but we hit a couple like hurdles on the way to production. Uh, the first one was everyone's favorite game, um, and so we weren't exactly sure. We weren't getting the sort of performance that we thought we would get based off of some of the benchmarks we saw online, um, and we weren't sure was it something we did wrong, you know, were systems under-provisioned. Uh, it turned out it was mostly us doing things wrong. We weren't, like, we were basically not using the API correctly. We weren't pipelining. Uh, requests, things like that. So we quickly we, we quickly improved performance, but there was uh, some things that was confusing. So for example, like the default recruitment sort of confused us. We found the tuning cookbook, and that sort of led us down uh, a path of like evolving our cluster configuration. So like when we started, we, we saw this. This is like CPU utilization with the, the default uh, basically settings with everything unset. And you see CPU is sort of all over the place. So it was a little bit difficult to reason about what was sort of going on. Um, so uh, we essentially uh, came up with a configuration. Uh, we went through a little bit of an evolution, but we came up with a configuration and ended up with a heterogeneous three-tiered sort of cluster uh, setup. So we ran, um, we run a stateless cluster, a trans transaction cluster in a storage uh, cluster. Actually, sorry, ASG, uh, auto scaling group. We're running all this in, in AWS. But that allows us to run um, uh, C5 instances for the higher compute workloads. And then we run uh, I3 uh, uh, instances with NVMe storage for the, uh, the storage and the transaction tiers. And that allows us to scale these, uh, these clusters independently, essentially. So. Um, a little bit about how we get this all sort of uh, provisioned in production. So we use Terraform. We sort of set out to then, so after we so solved some of the performance issues and we were, we were, we were getting the results we expected, we sort of uh, started templatizing the infrastructure. We run, um, as I said, three auto-scaling groups, uh, and then we run a container orchestration system on top of that. Um, We'll talk about that in a moment. And we run a bunch of um, supporting tools that we wrote in-house. And we hope to actually open source and share with the communi community uh, on top of the instances as well. Um, we run the FTB server process directly on the boxes. And I think we run FTB monitor as well. So 
Uh, just a little bit, look at the, the terror code. Um, like if you look at the, the top of our installation, um, we basically have uh, everything broken down by environment and um, all the foundation DB config is under there. Um, we have like an input and a main file. Just running through this quickly, we can specify the instance type, the number of processes to run, uh, any sort of tuning we wanna do, knobs and things like that. And then we actually uh, provision each individual tier. So here we're looking at the storage tier and the stateless tier. Um, and then at the cluster level, this is where we actually have our implementation. So we're running for container orchestration. We're not on Kubernetes right now, we're on ECS. Um, but this is a, we have AWS implementation and then we have some of our services down there. So you can basically um, stand up a new, any, a new service um, and create a, uh, a .tf file uh, in your environment and basically it will stand up um, auto scaling groups, it will stand up the container orchestration systems and then run these services that we wrote, uh, the supporting services uh, on top of those systems. A little bit uh, about the sort of how we provision the boxes when they come up. So we use the user data configuration. So we build we build all of the uh, of our Amy's with Packer, and then we use user data configuration to basically specify what class this is and any other properties uh, associated with like tuning, so so knobs or uh, any other parameters we want to pass. And then when the instance is booted up, we we have a um, bootstrap uh, that runs and a set of systemd processes that go ahead and look at it. They determine what type of, what class this is. It says, oh, okay, it's a storage node. I need to uh, mount the NVMe. I need to format the device. And then I need to finally build the, um, the foundationdb.conf. Um, so we have this, this uh, script called configure FDB that gets executed. Uh, and it basically sets all our parameters, sets our locality zone ID for replication, sets up the backup, um, and, uh, and then we're sort of off. So uh, that's like the core of, the, um, of the, uh, the Terraform configuration. And then as I mentioned, we have a few services that support the system um, that run on the ECS uh, or, or any container orchestration system. Um, so the first one, we, uh, the first one is FDB discovery. Um, and I, I guess you, you all are probably familiar with this problem. Yeah. So, so uh, basically what FDB discovery is, is it's just a small service that, uh, that runs on all the clusters. Uh, it's fronted by a load balancer and you can curl that service and basically get back the FDB.cluster config, pop it in FDB.cluster and uh, add your node to, to uh, your cluster. We have a process uh, called FDB trace, uh, and that is uh, um, basically parses all the uh, trace log files and converts them to metrics, um, and, uh, and we feed those into Datadog today. So just a, a look at some of those. Um, for example, this view right here, it's showing like a chart with master recovery commits. Uh, it shows you queues for um, storage servers and transaction nodes. Um, you can see data in flight um, and moving data that's actually queued. Um, you can see mean and max uh, bytes per commit. Uh, and then we also track uh, transaction latency, P90 uh, and max. Um, and then probably, uh, and then the last process, we actually have a couple more uh, supporting tools, but the last one we're gonna talk about today is FDB backup. Uh, and that just basically kicks off the backup process. So we moved, um, when we started, we were on uh, a 6.0 version. It was, I can't re recall what it was, but we, we moved to 18 for the, the blob store backup support. Um, it was pretty smooth. We ran into a couple issues with expiring data. Um, uh, um, I think we were one of the first people to use it because I was, I was posting on the forum asking questions and I think we were sort of early on with it. Um, we're considering moving to maybe a, you know, a hot standby with the uh, DR agent um, and kind of because of the limitations we've seen around how quickly we can recover from uh, backup. And so I think Evan talked about this earlier, but this is a, this is a screenshot of like uh, a game day test we ran where we basically rebuilt the, rebuilt the, restored the cluster from S3. Uh, looks like we were mostly maxed out on CPU, but after we pulled down, uh, after we pulled down batches of data, it takes a while for it to apply. So this was like, it was a couple terabytes on disk and it took several hours. So, um, 
Uh, okay, and then so I'm going to talk a little bit about game day and chaos testing, and then we'll wrap up with um, some future use cases. So before we put it into production, we wanted to run through and try to break it uh, is uh, is as good as we or as well as we could. We 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 tried to um, induce. Uh, tons of different uh, failures. Uh, the system behaves just as, as advertised, it was great. Um, so uh, we were able to kill pretty much anything in the cluster and, and it behaved well. We did notice that partitioning storage nodes resulted in um, high CPU utilization, for example, as the cluster healed. Um, we also created a scenario where the performance dropped by basically exhausting a disk, but we did that sort of not through the foundation DB path. We just basically allocated a bunch of space on a drive. And so uh, we spoke with engineering and they're like, yeah, don't do that. So, <laughs> so this is an example for example of like losing a, losing a storage node during game day. And we're like, okay, well the cluster's healing. Healed pretty quick. We, we saw increase in latency, uh, but uh, our workload is, the, the data's in Kafka. So we can handle a little bit of latency and then we just burn it down quickly after. And this was the case where we uh, essentially uh, exhausted storage on a node, and then once the, the node basically handed off data, uh, the system recovered. So other than that, it's been, um, uh, you know, it's been great. Um, it's fantastic. Uh, it's been really sort of hands off as far as uh, operational stuff. It's, it's been really good. So uh, some ongoing issues we have though, and I think these were mentioned today, one of the, the data distribution uh, unpredictability. Um, I think it's probably predictable, but I'm not <laughs> exactly sure how it's behaving. So maybe just some more uh, you know, observability or some metrics associated with that would be great. Um, we need to internally consider three data hall. We're running across three AZs and we're doing triple replication now. And I think that's really ideal if you have five locality uh, zones. So I think three data hall would be better for us when we're running with three AZs. Uh, and then I'd like to see maybe some, um, some ability to throttle things like healing or things like that. If I want to trade off uh, latency for recovery time for healing time or things like that. Uh, finally, uh, let's talk about some potential future use cases. So we're trying to get to the point where this is a sort of a primitive inside of a segment and new uh, product teams can come start up new foundation DB instances, get off and get running uh, and just build their stuff on top of this. One of the use cases um, that we're considering is uh, for a system we have internally called DDoop. Uh, basically, a lot of the messages we get come from mobile devices, and mobile devices are on uh, cellular networks, and those are not necessarily reliable. People are going under bridges, going indoors, losing signal all the time, so we get a lot of duplicate messages. So we have a system called DDoop that sits sort of in the, towards the end of the pipeline, and essentially the way it works is we hash messages by message ID to a Kafka topic, and then <clears throat> we have a worker per topic and topic and partition that consumes that and says, it looks in a local database, it's RocksDB today, uh, and says, have I seen this message before? If it has seen it, it would suppress it from going downstream. Otherwise, if it's the first time it sees it, it writes to Kafka and it commits to RocksDB. So, and then we jump through a bunch of hoops to make that actually work, because <laughs> it's not atomic to write to, uh, to Kafka and write to rocks. But anyway, when we restart, we, we read our writes. Um, but this system is, um, it's pretty good um, because it's fast and um, basically you don't have to deal with any issues with network partitioning. Uh, and it's an embedded database. But the problem is, is it's, um, it's difficult to scale um, because it's tied to Kafka. So if you wanna increase your Kafka um, partition count, if you need to increase your count, um, to add more processing power to the system. Uh, we have to jump through a bunch of hoops to basically shuffle all this data. Um, so uh, it would be nice to move this workload to foundation DB. So we could have an elastic tier depending on how much, uh, how many messages are coming in, what the volume is, those could scale up and down. Um, query foundation DB to determine if we've seen these messages before and, um, and suppress if needed, otherwise forward down the rest of the pipe. And that is it.